Good morning and praise the Lord. God bless you. We're delighted to be in the house of God today on this Sunday morning, and we're happy that you're with us. And uh, we believe and know that this is going to be a time of edification and that God's going to help you and strengthen you and, and teach us all some things as we look into his word today. So please join us. I'm Pastor Harshley, Pastor Tommy Harshley, uh, and we're here at Grace New Covenant Church. Uh, please tell somebody else that they can tune in this morning. We'd be happy for everybody to be part of the virtual church. And uh, adults and children, these lessons are such that uh, even children, particularly over the age of 12 or so, will be fine understanding them as well. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the blessing of, of this day, and we thank you for the opportunity to look into the perfect law of liberty. And I pray, Lord, that you'd open our hearts and our minds, that we would receive and understand all that you have for us, and we ask it all in Jesus' name, and we say amen and amen. If you have your lesson, uh, if you have your quarterly, lesson number seven, uh, entitled Seeing Beyond the Present. Seeing Beyond the Present. Um, and as we say, if you don't have a lesson, a quarterly, or book, that's fine. Turn with me to the book of Zechariah. Uh, and uh, we're going to focus there. And um, you'll be just fine. I encourage you to take notes uh, as we go forward. I, I'm, a, I'm a note taker. I've always been a note taker uh, in, in church. It just helps me to go back later and reflect on and and uh, try to understand in a deeper way maybe that, that I didn't get the first time as it shot by me. But uh, take notes today. Zechariah. And um, let's begin with, we're going to be in chapter 3. The lesson <coughs> is entitled, Seeing Beyond the Present. Seeing Beyond the Present. And uh, this whole quarterly theme is living in the light. And um, uh, this is beautiful because, well, we'll see in a moment here. It's, it's an encouragement to look to the future. Uh, based on what God's word says. So Zechariah chapter 3 and uh, verses 7 and 8 are the key uh, text. When I was growing up, we used to call it the golden text. But uh, the focus verse, Zechariah chapter 3, <coughs> verses 7, 8. Uh, if you're looking around, Zechariah is at the very end, uh, the next to the last book of the Bible in the Old Testament. Uh, chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8. Listen to the scripture. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou, and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And that's Joshua chapter seven, verses, chapter 3, verse 7. And eight. Um, the book of Zechariah, I just need to, to give uh, some background and real context, I think, this morning to uh, help us understand it. It may not be a book for which uh, we have for the average Christian that you may have a lot of familiarity with. It is one of the so called minor prophets, and we've said this before that minor doesn't speak to the importance, it's just, it just simply speaks to the length of, of their testament or the length of their writing. Uh, although uh, Zechariah actually is, is one of the longer, if not the longest, uh, of the minor testaments, minor prophets, has 14 chapters in it. So it's fairly, uh, fairly lengthy. And um, the, the content of it is, is quite unique. Before I get to that, let me read the focus thought as well, though. The focus thought is this. God gives us visions of the future to encourage us to be faithful in the present. Very beautiful. God gives us visions of the future to encourage us to be faithful uh, in the present. And so uh, let's keep that in mind, uh, the future vision that he gives us so that we can be faithful in the here and now. We see that very truly uh, within the life of Zechariah with respect to God's people and what he told them and what God gave him to tell the people of the Lord. Zechariah, let's back up and give a little bit of the history and context of it. Uh, is in the, the period that the, the theologians, historians, uh, church historians call the post-exilic period. Post-exilic period. This is right. This is after the Babylonian captivity of, of 70 years. And so he's part of that, um, that group of people that have returned uh, back to the homeland. And uh, he is ministering to them uh, in the process of their rebuilding. Uh, we've looked in previous lessons at Ezra and Nehemiah, two of the f figures that we're very familiar with with respect to their books in the Old Testament. 
in their process. In Ezra and Nehemiah, we actually read uh, the sort of the narrative of the events that happened while they were doing that. And so they come back, and first they're rebuilding the temple, which is a long uh, process, and uh, part of that uh, we will deal with with Zechariah. And then ultimately they come back and they build the walls, uh, the story of Nehemiah, for the people who had a mind to work. Remember, remember those two stories. Um, and so they, they come back from, from Babylon, and they come back uh, not just all at one time, but they come back in waves or in groups, if you might say it like that. And the first group comes back, and they are uh, led by a man by the name of Zerubbabel. We, we might call him the king, but he's the leader of those who have come and returned from, uh, from Babylon. Uh, and uh, at that, that, that time, we have Ezra the priest uh, working with Zerubbabel. And so they're working very hard. And so in addition to those figures sort of on the uh, sort of on the political side of all that's happening in that history, th then, then we have um, the prophets. Last week, we dealt with Haggai. Uh, and the lesson you recall, that his famous words, consider your ways. Something about that just always sticks with me. It's, it's just so direct and it's so to the point. It's the most direct of probably all the Old Testament prophets uh, that we have a record of consider your ways and so he tells the people of God consider your ways and a contemporary with uh, Haggai is Zechariah who we're dealing with today so Haggai's book consider your ways it's only two chapters uh, really quickly you can read it in a couple minutes uh, Zechariah's book is 14 chapters and it is not very direct it is a very if I can use the term almost a mystical um, a book in certain portions of it because uh, he deals largely with dreams and with visions. And in fact, a night vision is what we really are dealing with. Well, anyway, so they, uh, Zacharias called the Lord. He is unique because he is a priest. He's a prophet. And as we would read through the book of Zechariah, I hope you have your Bible with you this morning, you'll see that he first gives a series of eight visions. We would, we would call them dreams, actually, but he has eight visions in the course of an evening. And then he has four messages, four words of the Lord to the people of God. And then he ends up at the end with two oracles. Or these are basically declarations that you might think of in that term uh, to the people of God. So that's sort of how the book of Zechariah uh, is outlaid. Let me, I'll actually deal with some of the, the visions that uh, he has. But he, he, he writes to encourage the people of God. We'll call them the remnant. He, he, he writes to encourage them. Uh, and, um, and he's very, very uh, diligent in doing that. And um, so we, if you look at uh, the book of Zechariah, as I said, it's 14, chapter, 14 chapters. And the first six chapters, he deals with all the, the, these night visions, or we said night dreams. Um, I'll, just, I'll just mention them to you in brief passing. And you can certainly go back and, and take some time to read them yourselves and, and get a, a deeper a feel for them. And so he sees the first uh, vision that he has is a man among myrtle trees. And that's a testament that the, the interpretation is that God was going to rebuild Zion. And then he sees four horns and four craftsmen. And it just says that God's oppressors are, are, in other words, the Israel's oppressors will be judged. In other words, really they're in Judah, but the, the entire nation of itself is referring to Israel, that they're going to be judged. The third, excuse me, the third um, uh, vision is that a man with a measuring line, it's like a, a a plumb line, if we can use that, if the carpenters use that, uh, is that God is going to protect Jerusalem. And then the fourth one, which is our focus for today, which is actually in chapter 3, that we have the cleansing of Joshua, the high priest. Joshua was the high priest uh, during the time that, uh, that Zechariah is, is on the scene. He's, he said, and he says that Israel is going to be cleansed by the Messiah. This is really beautiful. We're going to deal with that this morning in some detail. Next, the fifth vision, the golden lampstand, that God is going to empower Zerubbabel and Joshua. Those are the leaders and the priests. Uh, and then the flying scroll, that sin was going to be judged. The sixth one, the seventh the one, is that there's a woman in a basket that the nation's sins were going to be removed. In the eighth vision, the four chariots, that, that God's judgment will come upon the nations. Uh, these are the secular nations. And so these are, uh, that's the, Je Je Jer Zechariah chapters 1 through 6. If you want to read that, seven and eight, four messages in, in chapters nine through 14, he has the two final oracles that are there. But let's pick it up in um, Zechariah chapter three, and let's try to get to what is important for us to understand, uh, beyond all the history here. Uh, Zechariah chapter three, 
I, I'm going to do it um, a little differently. Uh, I'm going to read it in the, um, I'm going to read it in the NIV, I mean the, the King James, but also in the NIV, because I think it's helpful in terms of the language here. Uh, so Zechariah chapter 3, listen to me. I'll read it in the, in, the, in the King James, and then I'll read it in the NIV. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. NIV. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. All right, so this is a dream and a vision that the Lord gives Zechariah. Uh, and all these visions and dreams the Lord gives him, they have a meaning and they have a purpose uh, and is ultimately for a message to be given to the people of God. And he says you know, right at the beginning, Joshua is the high priest. Uh, he is the one uh, who has the responsibility uh, of ministering to God's people there back in Jerusalem now that they have returned. Uh, this is not Joshua, uh, the successor to Moses. This is another Joshua, another person with that same name. And he's the high priest. Uh, he shows him standing uh, before the angel of the Lord. Now, th this is, um, as we read further, you're going to see that this is uh, and actually one of the Old Testament uh, ways of referring to what the theolo theologians call a theophany. In other words, it is an actually an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ, and it is actually a reference to God himself. And the angel of the Lord here refers to God. That's who it, that's who it is, and you're going to see, we're going to see even in the context here, how that absolutely has to be the case. And so we see Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord, and Satan, he is, is, he is the accuser or the, uh, the opposer. That's what he is. He's the, the, the literally, the, the, they can be the name Satan or the title Satan. Anyway, he is an accuser and he's an opposer. Um, and this is another one of those rare instances where we, 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 where we see that uh, it is, it's very strange. I remember some years, well, in the book of Job, we find that the devil presented himself uh, before the sons of God. And, and so somehow he's in, seemingly in the heavenly realm. Uh, so he has, has some level of access to God. And if he, in this vision here, we see that this, this, the Satan himself, again, uh, that, that there's some uh, seemingly uh, access to the heavenly realm uh, that he has, and even to God himself. All right, but he goes on, he says here, you have Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord, and Satan himself sent his right hand to resist him uh, or to accuse him. And uh, really, th this is the taking from part of, uh, of the history of, of the judicial proceedings at that time where the person who was the accuser stood on the right hand side. So the scripture actually points that out in the significant place. Just as in our courtroom, we have a place where we have the bailiff and we have the witnesses and we have the lawyers table, all that. But there's a place that for the accuser to stand and that's where the devil stands here. And who is he accusing? He's accusing Joshua. And here what you un understand as well that this reference to Joshua is not just to Joshua the individual, but he is symbolic of the entirety of Israel. He's, he, he's, he, he is symbolic of all of God's people who have now returned uh, back to uh, Jerusalem. Verse 2, um, I'm reading the King James and in the NIV. And the Lord said unto Satan, and the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. It is not, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? All right, the same verse uh, reading in the NIV. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. There's an explanation mark. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? And so uh, the, 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 the devil is there and he's accusing Joshua. But as we understand, he's accusing not just Joshua, but he's accusing the whole nation. And he's accusing them what? Of, of sin. Uh, that... Uh, that there is sin or an accusation of sin that has been made and uh, the, the enemy is, 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 is eager to place this uh, reality of this accusation before the Lord uh, and he does that. He says that, that this man, this nation, that he is a, a sinner. Uh, in fact, the New Testament tells us that with respect to the devil that, in, that in fact one of the names that is used of him is that he is an accuser of the brethren. That, that part of what he does is, is to accuse 
uh, the saints of wrong and of sin, that they're not right. They still does that. But we have an advocate with the Father. Bless the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the righteous, John tells us. All right. And uh, so the Lord responds to him and he says, I rebuke you. Uh, I've, I've chosen Jerusalem. I rebuke you. It's not this a brand or this is a man plucked out of the fire. In other words, this is an individual and these are a group of people that I have chosen. I have plucked them out of the fire here. In other words, I've plucked them out of the place of judgment. They were in Babylon, but I've taken them back now. I have made the eternal choice based on my own will and purposes to redeem them. I have plucked them out of the fire. In other words, I have chosen them. Understand that if God has chosen, then it doesn't matter what the devil says. Hear me, my friend, this morning. If God has chosen you, don't be bound by the accusations of the enemy in the past. I've talked to so many saints over, over the years, different, different, different settings, and sometimes we, people have done things, all of us, and some things we have done, we don't even like to think about them anymore. We just, you just it's like, was that really me? And he said, yes, that was really me. Uh, and, and sometimes things that we have done and uh, wonder, can God forgive me? Will he forgive me? I want you to know if God has chosen you, bless the name of the Lord, then he has chosen you based on his full knowledge and understanding of who you are. Hallelujah. If God be for you, who can be against you? I want you to stand this morning and not be bound by the devil and the accusations that he has made. And don't continue to live in the past when God has chosen you. Hallelujah. All right, let's go further here. Verse uh, 3, we're in, for those of you joining us, we're in Zechariah chapter 3. We're dealing with the subject, seeing beyond the present. So let me hasten on here. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Uh, and uh, let me read verse 3 in the, King, in the NIV. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood, uh, as he stood uh, before the angel. Uh, yes, uh, yes, before the angel. This is a subdued point. Uh, he, he's, Joshua is standing before God, and he's in the, in the presence of God, and he's the, the devil's accusing him. And he's standing there, and he's actually standing there filthy. He's standing there dirty. Uh, and um, it's, this is a, it strike us as a, you know, a strange thing, but really uh, that's definitely out of place. Why would he, anyone, and this is particularly Joshua, he's, he's the high priest, standing there before God in dirty clothing. And I don't want to be vulgar necessarily here, to, but if you really dig into it, what, the, what, the, what, what some theologians and history theologians say here is that really, when you look at the language of this, is what he's really saying is that Joshua, is, is this priest is standing there in clothing, clothing that is filthily stained with excrement. I won't go any further than that, that he's absolutely filthy. All right, let's pick it up at verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. The same verse uh, 4 in the in NIV. The angel said to those that who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. How wonderful this is. There is a reference to the word of the Lord to us being clothed in robes of righteousness, ultimately in our eternal destiny, in place before the Lord, that we're going to be clothed in robes of righteousness, white robes, pure before God. And we see a, 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 a sort of precursor of that here with Joshua. There's no question that he has on dirty clothes. Don't know what all he's done but it's, it's been ugly. Uh, but God has made the, the, the proclamation that I'm going to put on him. Hallelujah. I'm going to put upon him righteous clothing. I'm going to clothe him in righteousness. And he did that for Joshua. And he did that for the people of God. That was the, he is, he's brought back out of Babylonian captivity. And he does the same thing for us as well. That he clothes us in righteousness. He has called us righteous. He calls us righteous when... He calls us righteous when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we put our faith, our confidence, our hope in him, when we come, obedience to the, come in obedience to his word, he clothes us with righteousness uh, and, and, and cleans us up and puts us in a place of right standing and of cleanliness and actually of holiness. 
God does that. He did that for Joshua, and he does that for us today. We ought to be glad about it. Somewhere even in this Sunday school, you ought to just thank the Lord. Say, Father, I thank you for cleaning me up. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for cleaning me up. Hallelujah. I was listening to some songs of this recently. One of those old Hezekiah Walker songs says, won't he make you clean inside? Uh, it is saying clean on the inside and on the outside. He's able to clean you up. God is able to do that. All right. And then we go on further. Verse 5. Now, remember, Zechariah is watching this. Uh, and he, this is interesting. Uh, I found this. Well, let's, 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 let's listen to it. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 5. And I said... Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Verse, 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 verse 5 uh, in the NIV. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. I, I just, uh, it's, uh, this little sort of tickled me just a little bit. Uh, but it is a reference here as, as he's having this vision. Zechariah joins into the vision, if you can just imagine this, that the Lord has clothed Joshua in clean clothing. And as, as, as Zechariah watches what's going on, he says, put a hat on him. And the Lord puts a hat on him, a clean turban upon him. And he does that being symbolic of him being covered completely from head to toe uh, by the righteousness of God. All right. And so the angels clothe him. And then we go further. And uh, listen to this, verse 6 in the King James, and the angel of the Lord, the King James says, protested unto Joshua, saying, read that same verse in the NIV, then the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua, which is a be much better understanding, that here God is speaking to Joshua, and this is where we really begin to take note here, because whatever God says, we need to hear it. We need to hear it, say amen, just where you are, whatever God says, we need to hear. What is God saying? So God gives him a charge. He's going to give him a, com a command. Now let's look at, let's, let's, let's hear what he says here. Zechariah chapter 3 uh, and verse 7. And this is where we begin with our key verse for this morning. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou will walk in my ways, and if thou will keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk among those or these that stand by. All right. So God's telling him something. And as we, as we heard that, we might not readily just know, huh? What, what, what is that about? Let's, let me, let's go a little further. This is why I'm reading it in, in the NIV as well. Verse 7. Uh, verse 6 says, the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. Verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. So just point something right here we talk about the angel of the lord and then he said this is the lord almighty one and the same individual is doing all this talking and so this is how we are absolutely certain that this is speaking of the angel of the lord is not just a, a an angel of the angelic host but this is god almighty speaking this is what the lord almighty says if you will walk in my ways and keep my commandments then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts and i will give you a place among these standing here uh, this is uh, a, a promise of the Lord, and it's a promise of the Lord that should give him hope and direction for the future. Uh, it gives him a vision for what is going to happen, uh, and it's a conditional, it's a conditional uh, promise that is made here, right? Uh, so let's look at it, let's, let's look, look, uh, sort of, you know, let's uh, disassemble it a little bit. All right, he says, first of all, two things I want you to do, two, two commandments, if, if, or well, two conditions. Number one, if you will walk in my ways, right, personally, if, if, if you will walk in my ways, in other words, uh, to Joshua personally, uh, to, to walk in a life of holiness, but to the na entire nation as, as a whole, that God says, I'm looking for what? A holy people. He says, I want you to walk in my ways. That you'll have to know my word and walk in obedience. And he says, if you'll do that, uh, number one, that's the first part of it, all right? If you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my charge. And that is, in other words, and keep my requirements. Hallelujah. Uh, if that, that you've been called to as a priest, but that, that you've been called to as a people, all right? I'm looking for you to be holy and I'm looking for you to walk in obedience to me. 
I'm looking for you to do both of those things. And that is true for God's people then, and it's true for God's people now. He's looking for those who are walking a, a, a life of holiness before him, that they'll walk, uh, yes, that I'll offer myself as a clean and a willing uh, vessel before you, Lord. I will walk as holy because you said, be ye holy for I am holy. But also, not just holiness, but I will also walk in obedience to what you've called me to do. Wherever it is that you've placed me in this world and whatever it is that you've given me as a role and a profession, I'm going to do that. He says, now, if you do both of those things, look at what I'm going to do. We're still in verse 7. Then thou shalt also judge my house. In other words, he says, oh, you'll, you'll govern my house. I'm going to put you in a place of leadership. You're going to be the head and not the tail. Yes. You're going to be the head, not the tail. I'm going to give you to a place of authority, all right? And uh, you shall keep my courts. Uh, this is the reading in the, in, the, in, the, in the NIV as well. And have charge of my courts, uh, the place of my authority. Uh, you're, you're going to be this. And with respect to Joshua, this was actually uh, the, the place of worship. You're going to be the one that's in charge of that, all right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to do that for you as a secondary part. I'm going to, you're going to have control over my house, and you're going, I'm going to have control of, of, of the worship and the house of God in that speak. And I will give you a place among those standing here. This is the last part that's very, very striking to us. In other words, what, what, how, did you, how do you think about that? Remember the, remember the setting now that, that, that Zechariah is observing Joshua, in other words, the nation standing in the presence of God and those who also are uh, uh, priests with Joshua as well. God is saying to him, I will give you access to me. Bless the Lord. I'll give you access to me. How, how wonderful that is to think about it, that you are going to have a place uh, with the real authority. Sometimes people will, uh, will sort of brag. Yeah, I've watched different things and somebody says, well, I got such and such a cell number, right? Uh, I mean, how would you feel if like if you had LeBron's personal cell number, right? You would say like, I'm sort of somebody, right? Because you know, right, I got access. Uh, the, the, the same idea here, of course, much better. But uh, you're going to have access to me in the heavenly realm. God says there's a place that I'll give you that's close to me. If you obey me, if you walk before me holy, God says, I'm going to do that for you. How marvelous that is. That's just absolutely beautiful. All right. And let's, let's move on down uh, here to verse, uh, uh, verse 8. Verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now, so here at verse 8. It begins to move not just for uh, what the Lord would do for the nation uh, in their time period and in that setting, but now Jacques Zechariah begins to move to a real prophetic uh, view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this way, he, he exalts the, the war, he exalts Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, in a marvelous way, uh, almost like Isaiah. Uh, and so he has a number of references here, and this is a, one of the most beautiful and most powerful ones here that we have in verse 4. He says, and behold, I will bring forth my servant, and he says, the branch, the branch, the root of Jesse. And speaking of, in the Old Testament, this comes up a number of times, and it's always a reference to the Messiah. He's speaking of him that's going to come. That always in the midst of whatever God is given in terms of, 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 of correction and rebuke, there's always the view that, uh, that there is a, a future and a hope for those who are committed to the, God, to, to the one true living God. All right. He says, I'm going to bring forth my servant, the branch. All right. Uh, let me, I'm going to read that in the NIV. Listen, O high priest Joshua and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. All right, back to the King James for verse 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, said the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. The same thing, verse 9 again in the NIV. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua? There are seven eyes on that one stone. I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land 
in a single day. Uh, again, a very uh, a bit dense here with respect to some, uh, some of the symbolic meaning of, of it exactly. But that stone represents, we think, is, is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the stone. He is the, the foundation. He is the, the chief cornerstone, all of it. That he has, he says, his reference to seven eyes, his reference to, I think, of him seeing everything. But he goes on, and, but the, the part that is really most striking for, I think, us that we would hang on to is this. The last clause of that verse, verse, verse 9, says, Lord, and I will, will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. I will remove your sin in a single day, is what he says. Can, can you have, do you have any type of guess or idea as to when that single day was? I don't think we have to go very far. It was on the day that our Lord rose, the day that our Lord rose from the dead. Uh, it, was a, it was the day of his crucifixion. Uh, it was the day when all of the iniquity, all the sin of all of the world was taken care of once and for all. When our Lord was crucified, of course, when he rose again in power, the Lord did that. It was one event that took care of, of all of that. That's a reference to what the branch did. That branch is the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we ought to thank God for that. Today, we ought to thank God for it. All right, in verse 10, he brings it to an end that for in this chapter. It says, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. That's a reference to peace uh, of agricultural plenty, but also plenty with respect to spiritual uh, necessity. There's more than enough. There's peace uh, under the fig tree and under the vine. Uh, there's just more enough. There's more than enough for all uh, to enjoy the rich benefit that God has given us. So we have this idea of a vision. He, he, he talks to the people um, and gives them a hope. He gives them a hope. And he gives them a hope in the midst of a lot of political turmoil. I didn't go in this history of dealing with how they came back and there were first King Cyrus and then ultimately there was a following and King Cyrus' son and then the, the people of God have returned. But then there's an edict that they couldn't, they had to stop building. And so there's back and forth and it's a period of almost 20 years where they're trying to just build the temple. And then King Darius uh, reverses some of the Persian law and allows them to go forward and building. So it was a lot of turmoil and, uh, and upheaval and just sort of back and forth uncertainty that the people of God were seemingly at the, the mercies of, of these godless people. I guess I don't know how else to say it. In the midst of all of that, the message that Zechariah gives is that there's a hope and that there's a future. And that's what our lesson uh, title and our lesson focus is about. It says, God gives us visions of the future to encourage us to be faithful in the present. I'll, I'll close it. Turn with me um, to to First John. I think that's 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 a good place for us to go. Turn to me to to First John, uh, chapter three. First John chapter three, and uh, this idea of of the hope and the vision that we have for the future. What it what it does for us. We, we see it was Zachariah's vision for the people there. And I didn't reference all the messianic prophecies that he references, but if just for your edification later on, you, Zechariah prophesied of the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ riding in Jerusalem on a donkey. That's Zechariah 9 and 9. You want to look that up? Uh, he, he prophesies concerning the Lord being sold for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, that's Zechariah 11 and verse 12. Um, and uh, of him being the savior to all of, all of the world, all of humanity. That's in Zechariah chapter 8 and verses 20 to 23. All that's there. And so there, they are uh, true. We, we see that um, the word of the Lord has come true with respect to the Messiah, to the prophecies that he made concerning Jesus Christ, that all those have came to pass. And so the, 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 the prophecy that he's made concerning, those were regarding the first coming of Jesus. And so he's made promises regarding the second coming, that he's going to be the redeemer of all the world. That hasn't yet come to be the case in its full completion. And so uh, we have hope because of that, that. We have a vision of there's a perfect world coming. I, this week, I think and we, we in the United States have looked at all the political turmoil even today. Well, I'm pre-recording this, but even in our week, we, we've looked at all the turmoil in our world, and we think, Lord, what is going on? What is, what is going on? But I want us as God's people to recognize that the Lord is in control, and that there is a day coming where God himself will govern, 
and it will be a perfect government. There won't be any talk of impeachment, of, of censures, of violation of duty, abuse of power, any of those things. There's a day coming when God himself is going to sit on the throne and he's going to rule the entire earth in justice and righteousness. Uh, we have that hope. So 1 John chapter 3, uh, this is a wonderful text that's very common and we know it. Listen to this, 1 John chapter 3 verse 1, I just love this. I, I want to read verse 3, but I just can't help myself. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. We're God's people, we're his sons and daughters. We're different than the other folks. The world didn't know him, and is not going to know us. Verse 2. Beloved, that's verse 2. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Thank you, Jesus. What is that? That's a promise. And it's, it gives us a vision of the future. I'm a son of God. You and I are sons of God, daughters of God. We're the children of the living God. And right now, it doesn't appear what we shall be. We look like, you know, everybody else walking around here. It, uh, there's, there's nothing about us that, you know, at least in terms of our physical, we just look like everybody else. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when, he, when he's going to appear... When the Lord appears, then there's going to be a great transformation, and we're going to be like him. Hallelujah. Going to be like him. That is a, a, a vision of the future that has not yet come, but we have that vision in our, whole, in our minds, and it gives us a hope for the future, does it not? And then verse 3, he says this. And every man that had this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure those who have that vision and that hope for one day being changed into the image of our father uh, everyone that has that hope in them it causes us to do something now it causes us to purify ourselves now that, that we would examine ourselves and walk in holiness before him because i got a vision of what's coming I got a vision of what's coming. This is a really beautiful lesson. I encourage you to take some time when you have an opportunity uh, and, and, and read through the book of Zechariah, at least portions of it. The lesson title today is Seeing Beyond the Present. We have to see beyond the here and now if we're going to please the Lord. Amen. That's all part of walking by faith. God bless you. I'm grateful to have this time with you this morning. I pray that this has blessed you and helped you. Let's close in prayer uh, if, you, if we may. Father, thank you today uh, again for giving us a chance to receive your word. And I thank you that even as we look at the writing and the prophecy of Zechariah, Lord, that it would encourage us to press on and go on forward, that we would hang on to the promise that you have and that we would have a vision for the future of all that you've told us is going to be the case. And we bless you and give you honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so happy that you joined us. I'm glad that you, uh, that you did, and I hope that you'll do it again uh, next Sunday. Invite somebody else. And in a few minutes, at 1030, uh, we'll have our morning service, so join right in with us and, uh, and worship with you here virtually as you're doing now, or you can come in person. Uh, either way, we're doing all the social distancing and all the CDC masks and sanitizing, uh, the, uh, the, whole, the whole thing, uh, and temperature checks, just all that. So if you want to join us, we'd be happy to have you with us. Either way, one church, we'll be glad for you to worship with us. So God bless you. See you soon.